Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Kama Ciel Carey's Employee Misconduct Defense Discipline and Employment Law Issues webinar, uh, taking place in August 2021. Uh, we're going to spend the next hour today reviewing how discipline comes into play in litigation, um, some ways to effectively implement and support the disciplinary process in your workplace, and then also some important legal considerations when you are deciding what discipline to implement, how to uh, implement discipline, um, and what that could mean in a potential enforcement action or litigation. Um, it's great talking to you all this afternoon. My name is Lindsay DeSalvo, and I am an associate at Kamasiel Carey in both the firm's occupational safety and health practice and employment practice. Um, and for our discussion today, um, I do represent and advise employers in all aspects of the employer-employee relationship, which do include um, counseling on disciplinary issues and um, questions about whether and how to implement discipline, as well as generally with claims related to discrimination and retaliation. Um, I assist employers in reviewing and revising handbooks where we oftentimes see uh, those disciplinary policies that would come into play here. Um, and then I also represent employers in litigation and uh, inspections and enforcement actions from OSHA, uh, where discipline can also be a, a big and important issue in defending against um, potential uh, citations related to those actions. And then I'll turn it over to my colleague, Ashley, to introduce herself. Good afternoon, everyone. As Lindsay said, I'm Ashley Mitchell, and I am also an associate at Con Maciel Carey. I am sitting or located in the Chicago office, and I practice in both the OSHA and labor and employment practice groups. Similar to Lindsay, I do employment counseling. Um, I also review and revise handbooks, and then I also defend employers um, in discrimination and retaliation complaints, which is the topic of today's webinar. Um, I've been at the firm for just about a year now, but prior to joining the firm, I did practice um, in labor and employment on plaintiff side, and so I will be sprinkling in some of those experiences as well as they relate to Title VII and discrimination claims. So I'm going to kick off the presentation today, and the first thing we want to do is just sort of review the major topics that we hope to cover, um, and we will try to cover them in a way that leaves time for some questions at the end, um, but to the extent we can't get to all questions today, we'll also make sure to follow up after this presentation. Um, so the first main topic today that I'm going to be covering is the ways that employee discipline can be used in litigation. Um, then the next topic will be the legal implications of disciplining employees, um, particularly in the employment context. Um, what, how, what role does discipline play? How might it come into play during um, litigation related to an employment discrimination or retaliation claim? Uh, the next topic we'll cover is tips for drafting effective discipline policies. This is going to be an important thing from a preventative approach and also to make sure that the employer is in the best position possible if litigation does occur. Uh, then investigations into performance issues and misconduct, the ways that an employer can substantiate and justify uh, discipline and why it hit the disciplinary action that it did. And then finally, some strategies for carrying out effective discipline in a unionized workplace. Um, as that is sort of a, a unique situation that has some additional implications and things that it's important for an employer to consider. So going to the first topic, uh, what employee or ways that employee discipline can be used in litigation? So the first broad topic that we'll cover um, is this idea of how discipline might be used or how it comes into play in discrimination and retaliation claims. Um, so these are just some of the best practices that we think uh, it's important for employers to have in mind, um, particularly when going into an EEOC investigation or litigation. Um, these are the things that are gonna be important for an employer to be able to point to 
um, to, you know, defend against any claim. And where we often see this come up is, you know, an employee is terminated for failing to come into work on time multiple times, for engaging in an altercation with a coworker, for not following some sort of safety rule. Um, and so they are terminated by the employer and then they assert that they were terminated, you know, actually because of a protected status like sex or race or religion or in retaliation for, you know, complaining about a safety issue or complaining about harassment in the work environment. And so to defend against those types of claims, these are the things that it's really important to do. The first is ensure that disciplinary and termination decisions are consistent with discipline policy. So if an employee is terminated and they file a claim of discrimination or retaliation, uh, that individual would have the opportunity in litigation to insert to assert that whatever reason the employer gave for taking the disciplinary action that they did is not the real reason that they were terminated or suspended or whatever the case might be, that they were actually terminated because of discrimination or in retaliation for some protected activity. And one way, and a really important way, that um, an employer could successfully, uh, you know, defend against that is to show that this employee was treated in the same way that any other employee was treated who engaged in similar conduct. Um, or on the flip side of that, that this type of conduct had not occurred previously or had not occurred in the same way previously. And so the discipline that they received fell in line with the employer's disciplinary policy um, and is substantiated by the employer's disciplinary policy. Uh, the next thing we point to here is document the reasons for the discipline or termination. Uh, you will see this as a uh, continuing theme throughout this presentation. Documentation is absolutely essential and documentation of the reasons for discipline will be very key uh, in defending against a claim of retaliation or discrimination in the EEOC context. Um, even if an employee asserts that a disciplinary action was unfair or unwarranted, if the employer can point to facts it obtained during an investigation, um, and documentation of employee statements or um, other documentation that might be relevant to support the disciplinary action, then it can show that its determination, its implementation of discipline was honest and that there were facts to support it. And so ultimately, even if a court determined that it was unfair, or maybe could be unwarranted in this circumstance, it's supported by fact. And so it cannot be for the reason of discrimination or retaliation. Uh, and then finally, make sure that there is a system in place to retain any disciplinary records. Uh, there is a statute of limitation for these types of claims. In the EEOC context, it's generally up to 300 days that an employee has to file a claim of discrimination or retaliation. Uh, in the state law context, it could be even longer than that. So it's really important to have a system in place to retain any disciplinary records that support why the employee was disciplined in this manner and the reasons for the discipline um, that an employer retains for an extended period of time beyond just the term of the individual's employment uh, in case they do file these claims so that there is you know, this documentation in the employer's back pocket that they can point to to defend themselves in that sort of situation. And then outside of the EEOC employment context, um, employee discipline can also be really significant related to citations and an enforcement action from OSHA. Um, re related to employee discipline, there are two primary defenses that can come into play. Um, and this is gonna be a circumstance where you have an employee um, who may be engaged in some conduct that is prohibited by a rule that was not in line with the procedure, and that led to the creation of a hazardous condition that OSHA then cites the employer for. Uh, one example is, you know, where a, a forklift accident occurs 
Um, and OSHA cites the employer for failure to properly train the forklift operator um, or for failure to ensure that the operator was doing what they were supposed to do, like looking in the right direction or operating at a safe speed. Um, and OSHA uses that to substantiate a citation against the employer. In that context, the two main defenses that an employer is going to want to rely on or be able to rely on is first lack of employer knowledge, and then the second is unpreventable employee misconduct. And we'll go through each of those in a little bit of detail. Um, from the employer knowledge defense perspective, uh, OSHA actually has the burden of proving four elements uh, to support any citation that it issues. Uh, the first is applicability of the cited standard. You know, did they cite the correct standard for the alleged hazardous condition? Does that particular standard actually apply based on the facts surrounding the condition or, or how the condition was there, what the condition was? Um, the second element is that the employer failed to comply with the cited standard. So OSHA actually has to be able to provide evidence that the employer didn't do something it was supposed to under the standard that it cites. The third element is that the employer's employees actually had access or were exposed to the violative condition. Um, so OSHA can only cite an employer for conditions that employees were actually exposed to that you know, were actually unsafe to them. And then the final element that OSHA has to prove is that the employer had knowledge of the violative condition. So this is where the employer knowledge defense comes into, pl into play. Um, an employer can present evidence related to this last element to show that it did not actually have knowledge. And so if OSHA fails on that element, it cannot support the citation. There are two main types of employer knowledge um, and two ways that OSHA can show that an employer had knowledge. Uh, the, the first is that the employer had actual or direct knowledge of the violation. Um, and that's going to be an instance, going back to the forklift example, where a supervisor was actually on the floor where the forklift was being operated and monitoring the forklift operator at the time and thus would have seen them, you know, looking all over the place or would have seen them driving too fast or recklessly. Um, and if they didn't do anything to address that condition and then the accident occurred, uh, OSHA could point to evidence of that and say the employer had direct knowledge because the supervisor is an employer representative and any knowledge that the supervisor had would be imputed to the employer. The second way, and I would say probably the more common way uh, that we would see OSHA support the element of employer knowledge is, th is through evidence that shows the employer should have known of the violative condition through the exercise of reasonable diligence. And what that means is that, you know, the employer should have been doing things to make sure that em the employee was operating the forklift correctly, you know, whether that be through training or through audits of the facility, um, that if the employer had been fulfilling that responsibility, it would have discovered this violative condition and should have done something about it before the incident occurred. On the flip side of that, um, for an employer, what they can do, sorry, Ashley, if you could just go back one slide, um, just to talk a little bit more about what the employer could do in this circumstance. So this is OSHA's burden. Uh, employer knowledge is an element that OSHA has to prove. And the employer can undercut any evidence that OSHA presents um, and you know, show that they really didn't have knowledge in this situation by presenting evidence of things like audits of the facility and of conditions at the facility, um, you know, by presenting evidence that this condition was really, really short in time, that this forklift operator was driving too fast for two minutes, and that was not sufficient amount of time for an employer, uh, a supervisor or manager to catch the condition and address it uh, before the incident occurred, even though they do these audits at the facility. Um, and another way that, or another piece of evidence that the employer can use to support that it shouldn't have had knowledge is discipline. If this employee had been disciplined and retrained in the past, 
Um, this shows that the employer does take steps when it discovers these types of conditions and would have done the same thing here if it had been able to discover the condition before the incident occurred. And then the next slide um, is the second major defense that discipline relates to in the OSHA context, which is unpreventable employee misconduct. Um, and this is an affirmative defense, which means that the employer has to prove all four of these elements as opposed to um, OSHA having that burden related to knowledge. So an employer would have to present evidence to support all four of these elements. Um, and I will say, you know, from a practitioner perspective, uh, OSHA does tend to disfavor this defense and really pushes back hard on it, as, as does the Occupational Safety and Health Review Commission and its administrative law judges. Um, they set a pretty high bar for being able to prove this defense, but if the employer has the documentation to prove all four elements, um, then the defense can be successful. Um, so those four elements are establishing a work rule adequate to prevent the violation, uh, effectively communicating the rule to employees, having methods in place to discover violations of rules and expectations and procedures, and then finally having a system in place to effectively enforce the rule, which is generally going to be that disciplinary procedure. So going to the next slide. Um, these are sort of the main sources of documentation that an employer would need to be able to establish the employee misconduct defense. And so to the extent that you have this documentation in place or can make sure this documentation in place, it can go a long way in an OSHA enforcement action in circumstances like the forklift example that I presented. Um, so as to the first element, making sure that policies are in place and that they are written and that they are accessible to employees. If they're in a handbook, you have the employee, you know, acknowledgement form sign that shows the employee was aware, um, things like that. For the second element, which is the training aspect, just making sure that training records, again, are written and documented and maintained. Um, and this can include sign-in sheets. You know, that's a form that we see, you know, really is helpful to have. The employee's name is right on there, shows that they attended this training. Um, an agenda or PowerPoint presentation is also really helpful to have to show the actual content of the training and that this specific issue was covered. And then for the third element, the, you know, having a system in place to make sure that um, issues are being monitored at the facility and looked at at the facility. And these are documented audits. Um, so if you have supervisors who are walking the floor, they're documenting any issues that they see. Uh, it's often really helpful to have a form in place for them to do this. And then finally, and the main you know, point for our discussion today, enforcing rules. And that is going to be where the discipline comes into play. And written discipline is essential in this case. And this is often where, um, you know, OSHA really pushes back, you know, what are, what are you doing to make sure that people are not violating these rules and to be able to point to a past disciplinary action for the employee at issue or for someone else to just show that this rule is enforced by the employer uh, can go a long way in, in uh, supporting a unpreventable employee misconduct events. And then the last slide here is just sort of, sort of a summary of how the two defenses differ. Um, I think the most important way that they differ is what I already touched base on, which is, you know, the knowledge aspect is OSHA's burden to prove. So an employer really just presenting some evidence to try to undercut uh, whatever OSHA provides to show knowledge, whereas the employee misconduct defense is an affirmative defense. And so the burden fully falls on the employer to be able to establish el every element of that defense and documentation is huge for OSHA. It's huge for the Occupational Safety and Health Review Commission um, to meet each element and have the documentation to show that each element has been met. So with that, I will turn it over to Ashley to talk about the legal implications of disciplining employees. Thanks, Lindsay. So as Lindsay said, now we're going to talk about um, the legal implications of disciplining employees. Um, first, we're going to talk about, you know, why this matters, specifically because 
uh, the decision to discipline could always be questioned by the employee. And particularly, they could reach out to an attorney who could say, hey, like, this particular action was unlawful. And so it's really important that when employers are making the decision to discipline an employee, they are avoiding some of the common pitfalls that we're going to discuss. Um, so in thinking about race, color, sex, national origin, religion, disability, age discrimination, and protected categories like those, um, it is important that employers are not only considering whether the discipline policy as it is written is neutral, but also whether its impact is neutral. And so, as I mentioned earlier, um, prior to practicing on management side, I did in fact, I was a plaintiff's attorney and I worked on several cases where the policy that impacted the employee was seemingly neutral, but it had a disparate impact on that employee in the protected category and it resulted in a lawsuit and multi-million dollar settlement for that employer. Um, so it's important that employers are checking to make sure not only that their policies are written neutrally, but they're applied neutrally. Um, one example that readily comes to mind, here in the state of Illinois, we have the salary history ban, which prevents employers from asking employees what their past wages were um, with their previous employer. And the reason for that is because while the question itself is neutral, studies show that men were more likely to be higher earners in a previous role. And so by the employer asking that neutral question, they were perpetuating wage disparities between men and women. Um, another common pitfall um, is the in the instance of retaliation. And so it's important to know that an employee or former employee who has claimed discrimination and retaliation could have the worst discrimination case ever known to man, but could make out a claim for retaliation. And this is something that I also saw quite frequently in representing employees or when I was representing employees. And the, the reason being is when it comes to a retaliation claim, so long as the employee engaged in the protected activity, such as complaining about discrimination or participating in a workplace investigation, and then the employer took an adverse action, which is defined as an action that would discourage another employee from engaging in that protected activity, that employee has stated a prima facie case for retaliation. Um, so the bar for retaliation is pretty low. And courts have generally looked at the timing of the adverse action as alleged by that employee. And what, they, what courts consistently have held is that the closer in time to the protected activity, the more likely it is that the employer has in fact engaged in retaliation. And so as we continue our conversation about pitfalls, it is important to note that the FMLA entitles employees of covered employers up to 12 weeks of unpaid leave. Now, once that 12 week uh, FMLA leave expires, the Americans with Disabilities Act, the ADA may provide workers some additional leave. And so employers cannot discipline an employee for taking protected FMLA or ADA leave but that does not mean employees have the right to abuse the leave. And so examples of abusing leave include um, the employee's failure to provide a pro an appropriate FMLA medical certification. And what I mean by this is when an employee verbally notifies the employer of their need to take time off under the FMLA, the employer has a duty to then provide medical certification. And when the employee fails to provide that medical certification to justify the leave and just starts taking time off, that could present, that is a problem under the FMLA. And so some employees will continue taking that time off while promising to provide that medical, medical certification, quote unquote, soon. If, if employers find themselves in this circumstance, they may consider issuing the employee just a reminder or a warning indicating, you know, the employee does have obligations under the FMLA to provide appropriate medical documentation, 
necessary to document their absence under the FMLA, the ADA, or what, wherever their covered leave may fall. Uh, another common pitfall that employees may exercise is that employees may not follow the terms of that FMLA medical certification. Um, and so what I mean by this is an employee's medical certification may provide for that employee to take intermittent leave, but once they've submitted that certification, it may be the case that the employee is taking blocked leave. And so in, if the employer finds themselves in this circumstance, they may remind the employee that their approved FMLA leave is intermittent. And so if the employee has a change in their circumstances and requires block leave, they may submit a new medical certification. Or if that is not the case and they're just taking block leave, um, the employer may remind the employee, you know, that their leave is only for intermittent leave. And so going forward, all tardies or absences not covered by the protected leave may result in attendance infractions under the company's attendance policy. And then another common pitfall um, is the employee's failure to engage in the ADA interactive process. And so under the ADA, once a claim for a reasonable accommodation has made, both employers and employees have an obligation to engage in the interactive process. And for the employee, that means discussing with their employer if there's a reasonable accommodation that will allow the employer to do, that will allow the employee to perform um, the essential functions of their job. Now, if the employee is not actively engaging in this process, employers have a right to notify that employee, hey, you have an obligation to engage to help us in this reasonable accommodation process. And so in noting those three common pitfalls, as Lindsay said, it's really important that employers are carefully documenting, you know, an employee who, for example, is taking time off that's not protected by their FMLA medical certification so that if the employee is, in fact, violating company attendance policies, the employer has a written record of the employee asked for leave, intermittent leave, the employee was granted intermittent leave. However, the employee did take additional time off that was not protected. So for each of these, the documentation is extremely, extremely imperative. Uh, next, we turn to the ADA and drug testing. Um, so the ADA, right off the bat, does protect disabled individuals from discrimination if they are qualified to do the job. And it's important to note that an addiction can be considered a disability in some cases. In particular, those who have recently recovered from a drug or alcohol addiction may be protected if that individual is now qualified to do the job and is no longer abusing drugs or alcohol. And so employers should be aware of this. And important, this protection does not extend to those who are currently using or abusing drugs in a way that goes against company policy. And so the primary reason that many employers choose to require drug testing is to keep the workplace safe. Uh, and, but as I mentioned, there could be potential legal implications for that drug testing. For example, if applicants of a certain race or national origin are tested as a condition of employment, but others applying for the same position are not, then that would be a discriminatory application of an otherwise legal drug testing policy. When it comes to disability discrimination, since some disabilities do in fact require medication, this medication may show up in a drug test result. If the positive result on the test is from a prescription medication, assuming that it's being taken in a way that is consistent with how it is legally prescribed, then it may be discriminatory to hold that against that employee. So it is imperative that employers are do know when the exceptions to disabilities apply are and are appropriate. And then I'll just give a quick example here. Um, the Department of Transportation requires drivers of 18-wheeler vehicles or of similar size 
to have a fitness for duty exam, including a mental health examination. And the reason being is because some medications that are prescribed to, to treat mental illness or mental health um, do have side effects that would otherwise make it unsafe for the driver of the vehicle to be driving. For example, sometimes those drugs can produce drowsiness. Sometimes the drugs can even create um, a blood alcohol content equal to alcohol impairment. And so, again, it's important for employers who are thinking about drug testing and thinking about employee discipline to consider whether or not this employee has disclosed that they are, in fact, taking this medication. And perhaps that is the reason for their positive drug test. Next, we are going to turn to tips for drafting effective discipline policy so that we avoid some of those common pitfalls and some of those. Uh... And so the first thing I think it's important to note is, you know, I've spent a bit of time talking about these potential pitfalls and how they could result in multi-million dollar settlements, but it's important to note that there are benefits to effective discipline. You know, at first glance, discipline may seem like one of the worst parts of a manager's job, but it can be an incredibly effective tool and opportunity for positive, productive communication with team members. And overall, effective discipline benefits both employers and employees. You know, it serves the mutual goal of an employee becoming a valuable member of their team. It reinforces the employer's expectations and policies. It provides an opportunity for, for an employee who may not otherwise be performing optimally to correct their shortcomings. It increases overall team morale because everyone knows that they are being subjected to the same standards. And ultimately, it positively impacts an employer's bottom line because having all team members working optimally in a safe environment produces the best work product. And so when we say effective discipline, or you may be asking what exactly is effective discipline, first and foremost, effective discipline gives the employee notice. So before disciplining an employee, employers should be sure that employees actually know what is expected of them and what is and is not permitted. And this notice can be communicated in a variety of ways, including employee handbooks, uh, which outline key employee conduct and policies, annual performance evaluations that allow employees to understand how you as the employer are viewing their performance. And then finally, verbal, or verbal warnings reminding the employee of how their conduct is and how it is in violation of company policy. So the first piece of effective discipline is going to be just communicating what is expected of the employee. And as Lindsay said, documentation is key to everything we're saying. And so when employers are communicating, employee, we employer expect A, B, and C of you, it's important that that documentation is written. The employee was made aware of company policy on XYZ day and the employee signed off here. Uh, the second piece or another piece to effective discipline is before taking any formal disciplinary action against an employee, the employer is investigating the alleged misconduct. A proper investigation is prompt, fair, and thorough, and it makes an independent determination of what happened and any of the surrounding circumstances. And then finally, in thinking about effective discipline, all matters involving employee discipline should be carefully and accurately documented. Documentation is extremely important in case Lindsay and I have not made that clear uh, because it's helpful if further discipline becomes necessary for that employee or if a legal claim were to arise. Documentation helps everyone who was involved in the investigation and disciplinary process remember what happened and documentation will certainly be asked for if that employee brings 
a claim. I know as a management side attorney, the first question we ask for, the first question we ask our clients if we get an EEOC charge is for that employee's personnel file. We want to see the discipline reports, any investigation notes, any notes related to verbal or written warnings, complaints, or just any written materials related to that employee's conduct and performance during their time working for the employer. And so in case it hasn't been said enough, document, document, document. And now as we are thinking about effective discipline, employers have tools at their disposal to encourage correction. So depending on the employee behavior, employers may be able to achieve their goals through less formal processes, but regardless of how the goals are communicated, it's critical that they're communicated clearly, consistently for all similarly situated employees and that there is a record. Um, some businesses may prefer to have a progressive discipline policy, which uses a series of graduated steps to deal with performance and conduct issues. And that's A-OK, -okay, just so that each time that employee who's moving through the progressive discipline, just so that's documented and employees who are similarly situated are moving through the same progressive discipline process for the same type of infraction. And so an example would, of tools to encourage correction would be a performance improvement plan. You know, this tool gives an employee who is performing below expectations the opportunity to succeed. This can be used when there's a commitment to help the employee improve. It can be used to address failures to meet specific job goals or to help that employee improve their behavior related concerns. And these can also be helpful because ultimately, you know, the employee knows what goals they're trying to achieve and the steps they need to take to improve their overall performance. Um, performance improvement plans or PIPs as they're sometimes called can help reveal a skills or training gap that can then be addressed. Or ultimately, if the employee fails to improve, a PIP can support a transfer, demotion or termination if necessary. And so now for some examples, uh, this slide has an example of potential steps that an employer may take to discipline an employee for inappropriate conduct or a violation of company policy. So first, the employer makes sure that they are properly communicating the performance expectations to the employee. Second, if there's a complaint or there is room for improvement, the employer should thoroughly investigate the misconduct by talking to witnesses and reviewing any relevant records. And we do have a part of the presentation later where we will talk about witness interviews, um, but I think it's worth noting here that as employers are investigating, it would be incredibly beneficial for the employer to the extent possible to maintain confidentiality and to make sure that there are no extra folks involved in the investigation. And the reason being the less people who are involved and the less people who know, the lower your chances are for a retaliation claim. So of course, employers need to do their due diligence and investigate the misconduct and talk to witnesses, but to the extent possible, keep that investigation team as small and close knit as possible. Um, and then, as hopefully you are now seeing on the slide, third is to discuss the conduct with the employee and offer an opportunity for that employee to say, you know, what their point of view is, what they, what they believe happened um, and how they believe they could, you know, correct their actions going forward. And then above all, it is extremely important in case Lindsay and I repeating this multiple times has not made it clear, that any discipline that results from the investigation is consistent for all of those employees that are similarly situated. And so another example that we have here is for poor performance. And so uh, this slide has examples of potential steps that an employer may take to discipline an employee for poor performance. 
So first and foremost, the employer should accurately and objectively evaluate the employee's job duties and performance using effective performance reviews. Second, in case you didn't already see this coming, is to create a written record of that employee's performance. And if that performance is not improving, consider implementing a PIP or other tools to give the employee an opportunity to make corrections. And then as Lindsay and I have continually said, make sure that whatever the outcome of the PIP, the performance review, that the discipline is consistent for similar performance issues for similarly situated employees. And now turning it over to Lindsay to discuss investigations. Okay, thank you, Ashley. Um, so in light of um, Ashley's discussion on the potential impacts related to litigation and how, you know, my earlier discussion, how um, discipline might be used in litigation for the employer to defend itself against claims in the EEOC context as well as potentially in the OSHA context, um, we wanted to take some time to go through how an investigation uh, should be conducted related to employee conduct that could potentially result in discipline. Um, because, you know, to the extent that the actual disciplinary documentation, the write-up or whatever the case might be, will be important source of evidence, uh, so will the investigation that went into um, supporting the discipline, coming to a determination, of what discipline should be implemented and justifying the steps that were taken by the employer. Um, so this first slide shows sort of the main things that you wanna keep in mind when conducting an investigation. Uh, the first point is that it should be prompt. Um, you do want to commence an investigation as soon as possible after discovering misconduct or after a report of misconduct is made um, to the employer. And this just ensures that you are getting documentation and information in real time, um, that you are documenting any information you get in real time, um, and that whatever happened, um, whatever the circumstances are, that the information you're getting from either the employee who committed the conduct um, or from witnesses to a particular incident that the information is fresh in their minds um, and you are getting all of the facts, um, you know, when it's still sort of just happened and there's still a good memory of what occurred. Uh, the next part is that it's fair. Um, so, and this, this goes back to something uh, I talked about in the beginning of the presentation. Um, consistency is very important in this context. Consistency, not only in the type of discipline that is actually issued, um, but consistency, consistency in how you are conducting these investigations. Um, you want to make sure that in, investigations are being conducted in the same way each time. Um, you know, that the determination of who should be spoken to and what order, um, you know, there is obviously some discretion based on the circumstances, but you want to try to be consistent in that procedure as well. Um, and then as you gather information, you are making consistent determinations related to the actual discipline issued based on the specific facts of the um, misconduct that occurred. You want to make sure that the investigation is thorough. So, you know, where there are five or six witnesses to a particular incident. Um, you, you want to interview each of them to make sure that you are getting all of the information. Um, you wanna make sure that you are speaking to the particular employee who engaged in the misconduct or who is the basis for an allegation of misconduct or a complaint of you know, harassment or whatever the case might be. Um, you want to make sure that you are covering your bases and that you are also reviewing any relevant documentation related to the incident. Uh, consider restrictions on who may conduct the investigation. So for some employers, it's always going to be, you know, their HR person is sort of the go-to in conducting investigations. Um, but, 
you know, some employers, smaller employers, supervisors might be involved in conducting investigations or managers. Um, but, you know, if an allegation is made against a supervisor or if there's some reason to believe um, that a supervisor might not be able to conduct an impartial investigation, the employer wants to carefully consider that aspect of it and make sure that there's no one involved in the investigation um, who the employee might turn around later and say, you know, they, they have, um, you know, some feelings against me or they are the ones that were engaging in the harassing conduct. Um, so they should not be the ones that are involved in the investigation. And then finally, implement a procedure to maintain investigatory materials. Again, this goes back to what we talked about in the beginning, just making sure there's a procedure in place so that all of the notes taken by the investigator, all the employee statements, um, and any relevant documents are sort of kept together, a copy of them is kept together um, in case the employer does need to go back and be able to substantiate a decision related to discipline. So the next slide is just, um, I'll briefly go through sort of employee interviews, because this is an important aspect of an investigation. Uh, employers do want to make sure that in conducting a thorough investigation, they are speaking, like I said, to witnesses, as well as those actually involved in whatever, either the misconduct or harassing conduct, um, you know, whatever they're actually investigating. And you want to make sure that this is done before imposing a disciplinary action. Um, so interviewing and obtaining statements from the employees involved or the individual single employee who is involved, and then also meeting and interviewing uh, any witnesses and gathering statements from them as well. Having them, you know, whether it's the investigator taking notes and the individual employee reviewing and signing it, or whether it's the individual uh, witness actually writing out a statement and signing it, you know, something to indicate that the facts gathered are accurate and that the employee stands by it. Um, we generally do not recommend a blanket rule requiring someone to participate in an investigation. Um, I know that that's generally the practice, um, you know, that that if you are going to interview a witness, I think it's the rare case where someone just says, no, I'm not going to be interviewed. Um, but you do, it is better to have it be voluntary. Um, although it's totally fine to just request an employee to participate in an interview without saying one way or the other, whether it's voluntary or mandatory. Um, and usually the person will, will participate. Uh, and we say that because, you know, it, and Ashley will kind of talk about this briefly, but particularly in the unionized context, there are some restrictions on interviews related to potential disciplinary action. Uh, so it's important to just kind of keep that in mind when working with witnesses. Witnesses are also more likely to be forthright um, when they are participating on a voluntary basis and provide honest, um, thorough answers to the interviewer. And then finally, you know, this is just sort of a style thing, it may kind of be common sense, but it's important to sort of avoid an interrogation feeling um, or a feeling of coercion or anything like that. You don't want there to be anything objectionable about the way that the statement was obtained that an employee could point to later on. And you want to make sure that um, the facts being gathered are, you know, the facts, uh, this is what happened, and that the employee doesn't feel like they're being thro threatened or coerced to say a certain thing um, that might not be what actually happened. Um, and you also want to avoid in an interview getting toward like a subjective belief or I think this happened or anything like that. You want to get the facts from your witness. Uh, the next slide, documents, making sure that you review any relevant documents. Um, if it is an issue of a rule violation, making sure you understand the employer understands what the rule requires and how the employee violated the rule. Um, and then, you know, when actually making a disciplinary, disciplinary determination, the employer probably wants to look back at the witness statements, um, the employee's personnel file, whether they've been disciplined in the past, uh, whether they've been disciplined for similar conduct in the past, which could influence the type of discipline that's issued now. Um, and then that leads into the next one, prior disciplinary actions for similar conduct. Uh, 
And then if it is, if there are ADA implications, like the examples that um, Ashley talked about earlier, the employer may need to look at any relevant medical information um, to see whether this is a situation where an accommodation might be needed um, or some additional discussion might be required. And then finally, I'll just briefly make a point of third party investigations. Um, oftentimes investigations will be conducted internally, but there might be certain circumstances where the employer wants to actually bring in a third party um, to make sure that any contention of bias or anything like that or animus um, is not a factor in evaluating the, um, the thoroughness of the investigation um, or the ultimate determinations that come from the investigation. Um, this could also be useful if the third party is an attorney, there might be the fact that you can have some attorney client privilege over the investigation um, so that any findings from the investigation would be protected and confidential under the attorney client privilege. Um, so those, those are the circumstances where you might wanna bring in a third party um, if there is concern that uh, there might be an accusation of animus toward the employee uh, that led to whatever discipline ultimately results. So with that, I will turn it back over to Ashley to talk about strategies for a unionized workplace. Thanks, Lindsay. So as Lindsay said, we are now going to be discussing strategies for carrying out effective discipline in a unionized workplace. So those workplaces that are covered by a collective bargaining agreement. Uh, in a union workplace, first and foremost, it's imperative that employers do, in fact, follow that CBA. Um, and so before the workplace is governed by um, a CBA, the employer uh, does not have a duty to bargain over discipline imposed before the CBA, so long as that employer acts consistently with pre-existing disciplinary policy um, from about 2016 until June of last year, this was not the case, but as of June uh, 2020, that is the standard. Um, the NLRB's decision in its 2016 Total Security Management Illinois case um, did impose a new obligation on employers upon commencement of a CBA relationship. Um, Total Security Management, so that case from 2016, required an employer with limited exceptions to provide a union with notice and opportunity to bargain about discretionary elements of an existing disciplinary policy before imposing quote unquote serious discipline such as suspension, demotion, or discharge. The board's decision in the June 2020 case, uh, CARE 1 at New Milford, explains how the pre-disciplining bargain obligation created by that 2016 case was in fact in conflict with prior Supreme Court and board precedent and that that 2016 case misconstrued the Supreme Court's unilateral change doctrine with respect to what constitutes a material change in working conditions and imposed a complicated and burdensome bargaining scheme that was just irreconcilable with the general body of law governing statutory bargaining practices. And so now, thanks to CARE 1, that 2020 case, employers do not have a duty to bargain over discipline imposed before the CBA. Now, that is pre-CBA. After the CBA has expired, there is a duty to maintain the status quo of certain provisions of the CBA during ongoing negotiations. So in Next Star Broadcasting, the board adopted the administrative law judge's conclusion um, that the respondent violated the duty to maintain the status quo by unilaterally implementing an annual driver background check and changing when it posted work schedules after the expiration of the CBA. And so the board held that provisions in an expired collective bargaining agreement do not cover post expiration unilateral changes unless the agreement contains language explicitly providing that the relevant 
provision survives the contract's expiration. And so if a unilateral action is important to you as the employer, it's imperative to include language that it will survive the expiration of the contract. Now, other parts of the CBA, such as management rights and no strike clauses, do expire with the CBA. Uh, in sum, the just cause standard, which we are talking about here, asks, was the employee treated fairly in light of their record, their offense, the evidence, and how others have been treated for similar offenses in the past? So if an employer who is under a CBA has decided to take a disciplinary action against um, an employee in the bargaining unit, they must, that employer must meet that just cause standard. And so in weighing these factors, arbitrators will generally ask, did the employee receive notice? Was the investigation fair? Is the company's position reasonable? And has the company been consistent with enforcement? And then finally, is the discipline proportional? Turning next to Weingarten rights. Um, so Weingarten rights guarantee an employee the right to union representation during an investigatory interview. So these rights were established by the Supreme Court in 1975. Um, they do not apply to regular instruction and training. Um, the distinction between instruction and training is um, for the Weingarten rights to apply, there must be a reasonable basis to believe that the conversation will result in disciplinary action. So with just general instruction and training, there are not Weingarten rights. However, if this conversation that's being had with the employee covered by the CBA could lead to a result in disciplinary action, and there's a reasonable basis to believe this, the Weingarten rights do apply to that particular conversation. And so when an employer is having a conversation with the union employee, the employer is not required to inform the employee of their, Weingart of their Weingarten rights, but if the employee asks for the union representative, the employer can grant the request, stop all the lines of questioning, schedule a meeting that works for the employee and the union representative, simply discontinue the interview or offer the employee the choice of continuing the interview unaccompanied or having no interview at all and foregoing any benefit that the interview might have conferred upon the employee. It is important to note that when um, the employer grants the request to have that union rep present, the union representative's role in the meeting is very limited. Employers should not allow the union representative to answer questions for the employee. And so while that union representative can speak, an employer may insist that an employee gives their own explanation of events, and the employer is free to tell the representative that, the, um, that they're only interested in hearing the employee's own account of the matter under investigation. Now, the union rep may attempt to clarify the facts, or suggest other employees who may have knowledge of them. Nevertheless, it must be emphasized that if the wine garden rules are complied with, representatives have no right, so those union reps, they do not have any right to tell that employee not to answer a question or to give false answers, and an employee can be disciplined if he or she refuses to answer questions. Turning briefly to the non-union workplace, um, as Lindsay and I had said, set the expectations for the workplace in writing. Make the expectations and consequences for violations very clear. Make sure that the managers who are in charge of their um, team members know the policies and enforce them and apply them consistently. And I cannot, and Lindsay and I cannot say this enough, Document everything and consider how to use the employee review process to correct employee behavior and set expectations. And so with that being said, we are concluding our presentation for today.
with a note to visit our blog. I know that many in the firm have blogged on some of these topics we discussed today, as well as other relevant considerations for employers. Um, we also have the CMC COVID-19 Task Force, um, which is addressing to date, I believe, how to safely return employees to the workplace, as well as other considerations for COVID and the workplace, including vaccination requirements. Um, we do have some upcoming webinars for the remainder of the year. Um, so if you enjoyed this one, make sure to tune in next month to employee handbooks, training, and internal audits. And here is our contact information, Lindsay and BC, and myself in Chicago. And I haven't checked the chat. Lindsay, do we have any questions? Yeah, it looks like we have a few questions. I know that we are right up against the hour. Um, so I, I see kind of two immediate ones that maybe we can address. And then if there are others that we miss, we can, we can go back and sort of follow up on those as well. Um, but one of the ones that I see here is what are best practices for rec record keeping and documentation of disciplining similarly situated employees? Um, and I'll maybe I'll, I'll sort of start responding and then Ashley, if you want to um, jump in as well. Um, I think this is a really good question. And um, obviously from someone who has a good understanding of um, how you know discrimination and retaliation litigation can work because similarly situated employees um, are definitely at the heart of an, uh, an employee's ability to prove whether they have been treated differently uh, because of some protected category or protected activity from a retaliation perspective. Um, so I would say uh, as far as record keeping and documentation um, when trying to justify a disciplinary action is that you do want to make sure that, you know, in the final write-up, if there is a final write-up or in the investigator's notes, um, if your, you know, final write-ups are pretty sim or simple and straight to the point, that you are sort of honing in on the ways that this individual's actions are different from others who have engaged in similar conduct and maybe are going to be subject to less severe, severe discipline. Um, I will kind of just point out the similarly situated standard um, is, you know, it, it can be very challenging for an employee to establish because they have to point to people in the work environment, you know, with the same supervisor who are performing similar tasks, um, who have similar job titles. Uh, every court is a little bit different on that, but you know that there is sort of these other things that the employee would have to show to to establish that someone is in the same position with them. Um, but I think it's really important in the either the like I said the notes or the actual disciplinary write up. Um, to document why this person might be being terminated where someone else was suspended, whether it be because, you know, the altercation that occurred was in front of um, a customer or a client, and in another case, it wasn't. Um, in the case of uh, tardiness or absence, you know, if they had absences greater in number or if they had absences that were occurring, you know, consistently over holiday weekends or on days where the employer has really established that you cannot be out on these days, these are the critical days, things like that, that would separate them from others um, and show why their more severe discipline is justified. Ashley, do you want to add anything else? Um, I think I just want to note that what Lindsay is saying is be very detailed um, in each of those investigation notes and not necessarily to perhaps name who some of those comparators might be or name what their infractions might be, but just making sure that when the, if it comes up for a claim and your lawyer is reviewing the facts, they are able to see like, okay, Ashley was tardy five times in a five-day period. And maybe Lindsay was tardy four times in a 10-day period. And so Ashley was terminated, but Lindsay was not. And not that Ashley's file says, has Lindsay's name. 
but that Lindsay is Ashley's comparator because we are similarly situated. Yeah, I think that's a good point, Ashley. Um, yeah, and I think, you know, just again, sort of having this file that you're maintaining of all the witness statements that you've gathered that, you know, show these differentiating facts, um, the notes that are taken, the actual discipline, any other disciplinary actions that the person has had in the past, those are all the things that are going to show maybe why, in this case, the discipline was more severe than it might have been in another circumstance. Um, and then I see another question here. Please discuss privilege if the investigation is being conducted by internal attorneys. Um, so that's a good question, something that um, is definitely a, a, an answer that could be very extensive, um, but I'll kind of sort of touch on the high points. Um, if the investigation is being conducted by an attorney, an in-house counsel, um, you want to make sure that it's clear that the in-house counsel, that anything that occurs related to, be, to the investigation is occurring at the direction of in-house counsel. Um, obviously, if counsel is actually conducting the investigation, that, that supports that it's being conducted at their direction. But um, if someone else, like someone in HR is actually conducting the investigation, if it's being done at the direction of in-house counsel, um, you wanna make sure that any correspondence, communication, stuff like that, support the fact that in-house counsel is actually directing the investigation. Um, I think an important thing to keep in mind in this context and what we've kind of seen um, from court cases and precedent considering this issue is that in-house counsel are often seen as having both sort of a legal role and a business role and a legal interest and a legal or and a business interest. Um, so where issues can arise related to the attorney attorney client privilege for investigations conducted by in-house counsel is where the business interest side sort of bleeds into the investigation and the ultimate um, conclusions and advice given based on the investigation. Um, so it's important to sort of make sure that the legal interests and the legal counsel that uh, the in-house attorney is providing is prominent. And again, sort of that the communications that might be ongoing related to the investigation and ultimate findings and determinations from the investigation um, are, you know, the, that legal counsel is providing those recommendations um, from a legal perspective and sort of separate from any business interest or perspective that they might have as, you know, sort of a, a member of the company. Uh, Ashley, do you have anything else to add in that sense? I think it's great. I think the only thing I would add is one way to make sure that it's clear that it's um, the in-house counsel acting as an attorney is who they are sending their emails to, um, that they're not just sending emails on and on endlessly to other folks in the company who may not be imperative to that investigation, so that they're keeping that email list um, and that in any sort of announcements or communication about the investigation to people who truly need to know and not to everyone who they may have otherwise communicated with. Yeah, and that's particularly true as to the ultimate recommendations or advice that come out of the investigation. Um, that sort of is limited to those with a need to know reason to be involved and to be involved in those discussions and that legal advice that's being provided. Um, although, obviously, ultimately, if the employee is disciplined uh, as a result of the investigation, then, you know, that the employee is, will know of the discipline and everyone else will know of the discipline, but sort of the legal discussions and analysis surrounding that should be kept confidential among those with a need-to-know basis to be involved. Um, so, yeah, we are quite over on our time. So I think we, like I said, we'll review the chat and see if there are any additional questions and follow up with individuals directly on those. And we really appreciate everyone joining us today. We hope this discussion was helpful for you all. Um, and we hope you all have a great rest of the week. Thanks very much.